take your Bibles, turn to the 139th Psalm, Psalm 139. Uh, let's just read verse number 14 to start. The Bible says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. We thank you for the good reports from the good jail services. Thank you for seed being sown. Thank you for those that asked questions and found out truth and answers to their questions. God, thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Thank you, Lord, for a church that still teaches the Bible. God, thank you for those that were in attendance and, Lord, what they gleaned from the precepts of thy word. Thank you, Father, for the good choir singing, the good congregational singing, the good special singing, the good time of fellowship. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here tonight or this morning, and you truly are good. The psalmist said you're great and greatly to be praised. And, Father, we know you inhabit the praise of your people, and I pray you'd come sit down amongst us this morning and help us from the Word of God. Uh, now, Father, use this unworthy vessel. May the Word of God be clear. May it open our eyes. Uh, may everyone take inventory of their lives. Uh, and may we truly leave this building different than we came in. God, for that one that may be unsaved, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Uh, for that one that's saved and struggling, I pray that they'd leave uh, rejoicing and that they found help in the Lord. Uh, for everyone in between, I pray their needs would be met. Uh, be with the sick and afflicted. Uh, touch them and help them. Uh, be with every prayer request. Uh, help us this morning. We'll bless you and praise you for it. Uh, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus, we ask these things. Uh, amen and amen. Uh, uh, we find in this psalm several tremendous thoughts. The first thing I'd like to look at is the supremacy of the Lord. Uh, look at what David was inspired to write about the Lord. Uh, verse number 1, the Bible says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and know me. Uh, thou knowest my downsitting, uh, and mine uprising. Uh, thou understandest my thought afar off. Boy, we start listening to this, uh, we get a little sober. Uh, God knows when you go to bed. God knows when you get up. Uh, God knows your thoughts from afar off. Uh, 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 he says in verse 3, Thou compassest my path uh, and my lying down and art acquainted with my ways. Uh, friend, there's never anywhere you go or anything you think that God doesn't know all about it. Uh, uh, verse 4 says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, uh, thou knowest it all together. Uh, thou hast beset me behind uh, and before uh, and laid thine hand upon me. Uh, uh, David said, Lord, you're behind me and you're in front of me and your hand's on me. Uh, I'm thinking, wow, what a place to be. Uh, having that hope and that confidence. Uh, no matter where you look, God's there uh, and his hand's upon you. Look at verse 7. Uh, whither shall I go from, the, from thy spirit? Uh, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Uh, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Uh, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Uh, if I take the wings of the morning uh, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, uh, even there shall thy right hand lead me, uh, and thy right hand shall hold me. Uh, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Uh, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. David said there's never been a time since I've been conceived that God's not been there. Even when it looks like it's dark, I'm not hidden because it's just as if it's light. Nothing of packs or effects the supremacy of God. Uh, he's all-knowing. Uh, he's omnipresent. Uh, and he's omnipotent. And he has all power. Uh, we see the supremacy of the Lord. Uh, we also find in this chapter, uh, the psalmist is stupefied. Look at verse 6. He says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. And I can, I can identify with him right there in that verse. When you get to thinking about all, of, all about God and who He is and all that He does, it's too high for me. 
Hmm? You know, God feeds the grasshoppers and the flies and the ants and the worms and the birds uh, and all the vegetation uh, causes flowers to grow, uh, uh, causes the pollen to make our sinuses flow. Uh, I mean, God causes everything to happen. Uh, uh, he's in control of it all. Uh, 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 God knows everybody that's been born, uh, everybody that's in the process of being born. Uh, God knows everything about you, knows the number of the hairs on your head, uh, uh, knows what you had for dinner six years ago and you don't even know uh, uh, God even knows what you're going to have for dinner tomorrow and you don't even know uh, I mean God knows it all when you get to thinking about how vast he is uh, that he flung the stars out on nothing and called them by name uh, he's the one that causes the sun to shine uh, he's in control of it all uh, keeps the earth spinning on its axis uh, and you get to thinking about all oh, that God really is it's much too high for me that knowledge is too wonderful for me. Uh, it's all I can do to remember my name some days. But you know, God never forgets my name. Mm -hmm. We see the stupefied psalmist, the supremacy of the Lord. But notice the summary of the, of the psalmist in verse number 14. He said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. We find that he deliberately praises the Lord. When thinking about all that the Lord has done in his life, all the Lord is capable of doing and what he is doing, the psalmist comes to this conclusion, I will praise thee. Amen. You know why we don't praise him? Because we don't think about him and think about all that he's doing. Yeah, hmm? Do you realize he makes all those all those blood cells in your body come together and do what they're supposed to do? You realize he keeps your heart pumping? He keeps your lungs a pumping? He keeps your brain activity a going? I mean, he does it all, my dear friends. When you think about that on a regular basis, you know what you'll do? You'll say, I'm going to praise him. Hmm? Uh, uh. Maybe if we praised him more, we'd be sick less. We find that the psalmist David deliberately praises the Lord. Notice what else in the summary. He recognizes that he was purposely made. Notice what he said. He said, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He said, I was purposely made. Hmm? It wasn't an accident. Neither were you. You might not have been planned by your parents, but you wasn't an accident. And you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Can I say that God made you, and when you think about that, you will reverence the fact that He made you. You are fearfully and wonderfully. When you get to thinking about how you tick, your fingers move because your brain's in a, a activity thought to them. And you think about if you get a cut, how your body starts healing. When you think about you're able to stand upright and walk. When you think about, just think about chewing your food and swallowing and then going to where it's supposed to go and you get the nutrition you need and then what you don't need you get rid of. I mean, you think about all that stuff. You are wonderfully made. Hmm? Uh, can I say this? Regardless of what the world says, you are special in your own right. Because God only made one of you. You don't need to join a group or an organization or anything that will tell you you are somebody because God made you somebody. He purposely made you you yes, sir. we find that in David's summary he also says the Lord's works are profound he said marvelous are thy works now can I say when we look into the heavens at night and see the stars we can say man that is a marvelous work when we look at creation and see all the animal life we think boy that's a wonderful work rhinoceroses and 
tigers and giraffes and ostriches and, and all. Okay. Sid and I went to that game out there in Denver. That big guy that plays for Denver, they showed a close-up on him. He looked just like an ostrich. But he's not. His name's Jovic or Jokic or Joker or something. I don't know. He's not from America. I don't know what his name is. He had an off night and still put in about 30 points. But you think of all the animal kingdom. You think of all the vegetation. Think of all the different kinds of flowers. And Mary's got them all at her house. Think about all the different kinds of trees. Think about all the different kinds of grasses. Just think about all the vegetation life. Think about the stuff you can eat and the stuff you can't eat. Huh? Like Chinese food. Huh? Just think about all that God did. His works are marvelous. Amen. Can I say the work of human life is marvelous? Hmm? Hmm? Scientists can boast in anything they, they can do. They can grow vegetables. They can do all kinds of stuff. But they can't take dirt and make a man. Uh, and you look at how our minds think and how our bodies are and all it's a marvelous work and David hadn't even seen it yet but think about the work of Calvary that was a marvelous work that God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that God allowed his son to bleed and died and shed his blood to be the propitiation for the sins of mankind. Uh, he allowed his son to become the perfect lamb. Uh, and the lamb laid down his life for sinners. Uh, that sinners could be saved from their sins. Uh, oh, what a marvelous work. God's works are profound. Say, why did God do that with his son? Because only God could do that with his son. Then we find that David concludes in his summary. He says, And that my soul knoweth right well. What does his soul know right well? That he's fearfully and wonderfully made, and marvelous are the works of God. He says that his soul is persuaded to these truths. Nothing will cause him to doubt that. And when you and I take a look at all God has done, and take a look in the Word of God at his truths, you'll be fully persuaded as well. I'm interested in verse number 8 this morning. Verse number 8, he is again talking about how God's everywhere all the time. He's before him, behind him, everywhere. He's talking about how he can never flee the presence of God. Look what he says. He said, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, a lot of people, when they read that, they don't understand, don't study the Bible. They think, well, God, would, does God go to hell? That's not what he's saying. Can I say that literally, he is saying if he was to go to heaven, now from David's viewpoint, the heaven are the skies, and anything he sees in the sky. He said, if I go anywhere in the sky, if I go to clouds, if I go to stars at night, if I go anywhere in the sky, God's there. When he's talking about hell, he's talking about the grave. He said, if I die, go to the grave. He's there. He makes a vast distinction from those things which are above to those things which are beneath. And can I say that to us, if we read it, we think about heaven and all that heaven has to offer. Can I say that heaven is a place of rejoicing? We know that there is shouting and uh, glorifying God going on in heaven today. Yeah. We know that there is uh, rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. Uh, that's going on in heaven today. Yeah, we know uh, there are seraphim flying above the throne of the Lord Jesus, uh, crying, Holy, 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 uh, the Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we know it's a place of rejoicing. Uh, can I say there's no sadness in heaven? Uh, there's nobody down and out in heaven. Uh, everybody in heaven uh, is having themselves a hallelujah time. Uh, it's a place of rejoicing. Uh, can I say heaven's a place of rest? 
rest. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us uh, that there remaineth therefore rest to the people of God. Uh, uh, we find that in heaven uh, uh, folks have rested from uh, uh, their labors, but their works here on earth do follow them. Uh, what a blessing to know. Uh, one day we'll lay down our heavy cross uh, and we'll, we'll labor no more, uh, but we'll be in the abode of God uh, and we'll rest from all our labor. Uh, can I say that heaven's a place of reunion? The Bible says we'll know as we were known. And I don't know all about everything in heaven because I haven't been there yet. Uh, but it is my home and I'm headed that way. Uh, but one thing I know, uh, uh, for those loved ones of mine and those friends of mine that have known the Lord Jesus uh, and have passed on into that glorious world, uh, one day I'll see them again. Uh, one day I'll fellowship with them again. Uh, one day uh, we'll worship and rejoice over the Lord again. Uh, uh, but not only with them, uh, I'm going to meet folks that I've never met. Uh, but when I get there, I'll know them. Uh, I'll get to meet uh, Abraham and Isaac uh, and Paul and Peter and James and John uh, and Daniel and David and Jeremiah. Uh, folks I've only read about. Uh, I'll get over there uh, and I'll get the rest of the story in their lives. Uh, it's a place of reunion. Heaven's a place of rewarding. We find over there that they're gold, silver, precious stones and crowns that uh, will be conveyed uh, out of them that come through the judgment. Uh, and my dear friends, we'll take those crowns uh, and we'll cast them at His feet because uh, He is worthy of our praise. Uh, we find some things about heaven in that place called heaven. But in this great distinction, He talks about heaven, but He also talks about a place called hell. I want to preach for just a few minutes this morning on that thought. I want to preach on the place of hell. The choir sang about it a few minutes ago. Can I say that if I preached on the love of God, the world wouldn't get upset about that? Can I say that if I preached about Jesus being born in the manger, the world wouldn't get upset about that? Can I say, if I preach about Jesus dying on the cross, the world doesn't even get upset about that. Can I say that if I preach uh, that Jesus rose from the grave, the world don't even get upset about that. But if you tell people that without Jesus they're going to die and go to hell, they get real upset about that. Mm -mm. So why you always got to preach about hell? I don't always preach about hell. But when God tells me to, I do. And I do because, friend, I'm afraid you may be going there. And you don't have to. There's a lot of misnomer about hell. Can I say there are a lot of people in the world for you to die and go to hell? I'll just smile at them and say, no, not going. That, that was said a long time ago, 49 years ago for me. Huh? I'm not going to hell. Hmm? Uh uh, and if you don't change your heart or trust in the Lord, you probably are going to hell. Hmm? But you don't have to. But I'm not going to hell. Huh? Can I say the world thinks hell's a big party? Just because all the idols they worship in this life live like they're going to hell, don't mean they're going to live that way when they get to hell. Hmm? Hell's not what most people think. Hmm? Can I say in hell, there's not a ghastly guy like you see on TV whose color is gray and he's got red eyes and his name's Lucifer and he just lurks around in the shadows. No, you are not going to find that guy there. You're not going to find vampires there. You're not going to find zombies there. You're not going to find a lot of things that the world is trying to desensitize you about hell. The world's trying to make hell a normal place. Mm, so you won't feel too bad about realizing you're headed there. But can I say hell is a horrible place? Amen. Let me say some things about hell. I won't preach long. I've got a few thoughts this morning. I want to make sure you understand. Can I say that hell is a place of separation? The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 9, the Bible says about those who are dying and going to hell, it says, Who shall be punished 
with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You know one of the beautiful things about human life is even though we do not see God, when we are walking amongst his creation, his presence is all around us. You look at the beautiful mountains and you can see the handiwork of God and know his presence is about us. You can see a marvelous sunset and realize God did that. His presence is around us. Uh, can I say that uh, you can look at the beautiful ocean and the waves coming and hitting the seashore and realize God made that and His presence is around us. Uh, you can smell a beautiful flower and, and, and realize the presence of God even if you don't know God. Uh, even if you don't consider God made that. Uh, uh, just being around His creation, you're around His presence. But more than that, he lives inside his people. And when you come in contact with one of his people, you're coming in contact with his presence. Hmm? You can't go anywhere, Miss Marcy, that the presence of God can't be realized. Hmm? Can I say that Paul wrote to the, in Romans chapter number 1 that even if you didn't have a Bible, even if you never heard a message or sermon preached, uh, even if you never heard an illustration about how Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, uh, uh, Paul wrote uh, that we can look at all that he's made and we're without excuse not to know there's a God. Mm. But can I say in hell, there is no presence of God. There's no presence of his glory. There are no sunrises and sunsets. There are no vast mountains. Uh, there are no chasms uh, of beautiful canyons. Uh, there are no chirping of birds singing. Uh, there is no beautiful scent of flowers uh, or any other aroma. Uh, hell uh, is a horrible place. Uh, and it begins uh, with separation from God. Uh, Hell is not a place of fellowship. It's a place of isolation. And even though there'll be multitudes there, you'll not have relation or fellowship with any of them because you'll be totally isolated and separated from everything but suffering. It's a place of separation. You know why God gave us the church? He loved the church and gave himself for it. You know why he left us the church? Because man needs fellowship. We find hope in others. We find strength seeing how God has worked in the lives of others. You know why fellowship is taken away in hell? So you'll spend eternity realizing you're there because you chose to put yourself there. This world we live in is get caught and blame somebody else. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm in the shape I'm in because my parents didn't raise me right. I'm in the shape that I'm in because uh, the people in authority are bad. I'm in the shape that I'm in uh, because the ones that came before me is the one that messed it up and I'm having to pay for it. Huh? I'm in the shape that I am because of where I was raised or what color I am uh, or how uh, I, I wasn't born rich like Bill Gates. Uh, and we blame our situation on everybody else. But in hell, you won't find anybody else to blame. You're there because you rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a place of separation. Can I say hell is a place of smoke? Revelation 9.2 says, And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. If I read the Bible clearly, it didn't say uh, there was rejoicing come out of the pit or there was sunlight that came out of the pit. Uh, 
said there was smoke as if a furnace was pouring it out uh, and that smoke uh, darkened the sun. I don't know if you've ever been somewhere where there's been a great big fire, but even days after they put the flames out, the smoke still lingers. Hmm? I don't know about you, but we need to breathe in air to be comfortable. You show me somebody whose air supply is low and they have to uh, uh, live on, on oxygen, uh, uh, their quality of life diminishes. But in hell, they don't breathe air. They breathe smoke. I don't know about you, there's nothing worse than feeling like you're choking. And that's the only thing you feel in hell. It's a place of smoke. Now we know smoke comes because of fire. And can I say, it will be a lake of fire. Can I say in one passage, the Bible says they'll be salted with fire. That means everyone that dies and goes to hell is set on fire. And the fire is never extinguished. They just burn and burn and melt and burn and melt and burn for all of eternity because there is no dying in hell. There is no annihilation to where hell ends. Those that die and go to hell are forever, forever, forever lost without God. Mm. Just as those that die with Jesus live forever and ever and ever in eternity with eternal life. It's a place of separation. It's a place of smoke. Hell's a place of suffering. There's no party going on in hell. But Luke 16 tells us, verse 23, And in hell, speaking of the rich man, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Seeth Abraham far off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things. But now he's comforted, thou art tormented. Three times in those three verses we find this man is tormented in hell. He's tormented in flames. His tongue's on fire and wants one drop of water to cool his tongue. Hell is a place of suffering. Can I say it's a place of affliction? You are afflicted deliberately with pain. It's a place of agony. The pain gets so severe, but it never gets relief. And I say it's a place of anger. Those that are miserable in hell are angry all the time. Can I say, man wasn't created to be angry. We was created to be happy and know the joy of the salvation of the Lord. Hmm. If you're honest, times when you lose your temper and you get angry, later you feel bad about it because it's out of your character. But everybody in hell have one emotion. It's anger. They're angry at God for making such a horrible place. They're angry at themselves because they ended up there. And they're angry at every one of us that, that knew them and we did not make sure and persuade them not to go and die and go to hell. Hmm. Oh, you may tell them, but it's so horrible and they're so angry and they're angry that you didn't tell them again. It's a place of suffering. In hell they remember every opportunity they could have escaped that place and they rejected the Lord and they're angry. It's a terrible, horrible, horrible place can I say hell's a place of screaming Matthew 13 50 says and shall cast them into the furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth people are screaming and weeping and wailing there are no tears from their eyes for that would comfort their skin they gnash 
with their teeth, at their flesh, trying to dull the pain, but the pain is never put out. It is a horrible, horrible place. Can I say hell is a place of sorrow? It's a place of regret. If you're honest here today, you can go back in your mind to some place in your life and you've said something or done something that you regret saying or doing. Hmm? If not, you're not human. You're a robot, get up and leave. Okay. No, you regret. But hell is an eternal, miserable life of regret. You regret every time you drove by past the church and didn't pull in. You regret every time you heard a message like this, the Lord spoke to your heart and said, you need to get born again, and you, you rejected him. You regret every time a family member let you know they was praying for you and you didn't want to hear it. You regret, you regret, you regret, you regret flipping channels in the middle of the night and coming by some guy preaching on there and you laughing at him and just kept on and going. You regret it forever. And I say hell's a place of scope. Place of scope. Comprehension. The Bible makes it clear that the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them that would believe lest the glorious light of the gospel shall shine unto them. The devil has blinded a lot of people in this world. He's hoodwinked them, he's lied to them, he's misled them, he's let them believe things uh, that aren't true. There are people that would rather believe we came from monkeys than from God. There are people that believe uh, God does not exist. There are people that believe that uh, when you die, God's going to weigh your good points and your bad points, and if your good outweighs your bad, you get to go to heaven, and you're a good person, so God's going to let you go to heaven uh, uh, he's going to uh, lie to you, tell you that all churches are interested in is your money. He's going to lie to you, saying all preachers are crooks and thieves. Uh, he's going to lie to you, saying all church people are hypocrites. Uh, he's going to lie, 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 liar, liar, pants on fire. That's what's going to happen to him. But when you get to hell, the blinders are coming off. And you're going to see the truth. You're going to see that churches were there because they loved you. They wanted to tell you the truth and stand for the truth. You're going to find that religion lied to you. You're going to find that politicians lied to you. You're going to find that teachers lied to you. You're going to find that neighbors lied to you and friends lied to you, but the church tried to tell you the truth. Christian people tried to love on you and show you the way. Preachers tried to tell you the truth. The church isn't all about money. The church is about the gospel. And telling folks they could be saved. Problem is, Brother Bob, they're not going to wake up right. until one day too late. Right. You say, Preacher, this sounds like a horrible place. I haven't even scratched the surface how horrible it is. You say, Well, if God is a God of love, and by the way, He is, He loved us so much, He made a way so we didn't have to die and go to hell. So if he's so loving, why did he create such a horrible place? I'm glad you asked. The last point of my message is hell is a place for Satan. The Bible says in Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Here it is, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20.10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is a place for Satan. You say, well, then how come people end up there? Because people are cursed. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and partook of the fruit God told them not to partake of, they sinned before God, and that sin's been passed to all of us. If you're breathing, you're a sinner. We're all sinners. We, we've conceived in sin. We sin willfully. We sin. We sin. We sin. 
my darling little grandbaby's right here and she's about as perfect as can be but she's still a sinner so how do you know that because we'll feed her a bottle and 10 minutes later she's acting like she's starved to death no she just wants attention she couldn't be that hungry he on the other hand is another thing the grocery bill went down $300 a month when he moved out but she is lying to us. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, and all liars shall find their uh, way, in, uh, their part in the lake of fire. So what are you trying to say? We're all sinners. Amen. The Bible goes on to say, for the wages of sin is death. Why do people die? Because people sin. Adam and Eve was going to live forever in the flesh. So they chose to sin, and when they chose to sin, they chose to die. Hmm. The Bible goes on to say, but God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God looked at us in pity and in mercy and in grace. He said they chose to sin, but I love them anyway. And because they're sinners, they can't come to our abode. They have to go somewhere, and there's only one other eternal place. Uh, it's the lake of fire. But they don't have to go there. I'll make a way where they can still be saved and come and live with us in heaven. Amen. The Bible does say, for the wages of sin is death, but it doesn't stop there. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You say, well, how do you get saved? The Bible says, for whosoever shall call it on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. How do you get saved? You've got to realize you're lost. That's what the devil does. He blinds people to the fact that they're lost and they're on their way to hell. You've got to realize there's a place called heaven and a place called hell. And if you're not saved, if you've never been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, never had your sins forgiven from God, uh, you're on your way to hell. Right. But you don't have to be. You can be saved. You say, preacher, you telling me if I put my faith in the Lord, He'll save me and forgive me of my sins? Uh, yeah, we told Isaiah, though thy sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. He'll forgive you of all your sin. Past sin, present sin, and future sin. Because you remember I said we're all sinners? Guess what? Saved people still sin. They don't want to sin. They try not to sin, but they're still going to sin because they're in this flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, we all fail the grace of God every day. But because I've been saved, I now have an advocate with the Father that when I do sin... I can call on him and confess to him in prayer that I've sinned and ask him forgive me and he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So how come you got an advocate? Because I've got a Savior who saved me from my sins. See, Jesus came into this world and lived a sinless life because we couldn't. And he died on the cross of Calvary and shed his blood to be the payment for our sin. He was buried according to the scriptures and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, proving he was the Son of God. And all he asked from us is to put our faith in what he did and not what we can do to get to heaven. And when you're willing to ask him to save you, give you of your sin, he will. And now, you become a citizen of heaven. And you don't have to worry about dying and going to hell. I'm glad I'm not going to hell. Amen. I deserve to go to hell because I was a sinner. But I'm not going. Because I've been washed in the blood of Christ. Not literally, but spiritually. I've been born again. And I've got news for you. He'll save you too. Because he loves you just as much as he loves anybody else. He allowed you to be here today so you could hear about that horrible place called hell and know you don't have to go here. There's a great distinction in this psalm between heaven and hell. I have one question for you. Which place will you spend eternity? 
If your answer starts with, I hope, you get the wrong answer. So you need to know that you're saved or know that you've rejected Jesus and you're going to hell. If you hope to go to heaven, you're not going to make it. But you can know that you're going to heaven because when Jesus saves you, he makes a new creature out of you. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And you can be saved from your sin today. I wouldn't die and go to hell for anybody. If you're here today and you're lost, in a moment we're going to have an invitation. We just invite you to come. Meet the Savior. Know that your sins are forgiven. Say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. You come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. But you can be saved today. Have your sins forgiven. If you're here today and you're saved, you might want to get in this altar. Thank God you're saved. You know, most people in the world have never heard the gospel. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you'd been born somewhere and never heard about Jesus, and you'd have died and went to hell. You ought to be thankful. Maybe this morning he spoke to you about something else, and you just need to come and experience a little First John 1, 9, confess some sins, get them made right. Maybe this morning you just need to come and, and, and ask him to help you with something. But most importantly, if you're here today and you're not saved, or if you don't know you're saved, you need to come get born again. And leave out of here different than you came in. We ought to all leave out of here different than you came in. I'm glad I'm not going to hell. Are you? Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Well, they pick out a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. You need to get born again. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus. Folks are praying. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for heaven. Lord, I'm glad I'm not going to hell. Thank you for the work of Jesus in my heart and life. God, I'm glad I've been saved, been changed. Lord, I fear, the fact you gave me this message, there's someone here today not ready to go to heaven. God, I pray that you'd speak to them. I pray that they'd realize the argument going on in their life right now, telling them to wait or put it off or any other argument. It's not an argument with me. It's an argument with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's telling them to get saved, Lord, I pray they just come. Make that first step. You'll help them take the rest. Help them come get born again. God, just speak to hearts. Have your way in this invitation. Father, we'll bless you for it, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.